although the growth of forensic psychology has been especially apparent since the 1970s, its history can be traced back at least to the end of the 19th century. When J. McKinn Kettle conducted a very simple psychological experiment on eyewitness testimony in a psychology class at Columbia University, Cattell merely asked his students questions such as what the weather was like exactly a week before. Surprised at the wide variation in responses, often given with absolute certainty, even though they were wrong. Cattell decided to explore in greater depth and with more sophistication both memory and the field of eyewitness identification. I have a lecture that coincides with this one in regards to Cattell, so please view that for additional information. Numerous psychologists subsequently undertook similar research. Some, for example, staged exercises wherein an intruder would enter the classroom, confront the professor, and leave. Students would then be asked to describe the intruder and the events that followed. To this day, both memory and eyewitness research remained of high interest to many forensic psychologists, yielding a rich store of information. Psychologists also studied other topics that eventually produced knowledge of great value to the legal system. Research on human cognition, child development, abnormal behavior, the detection of deception, and stress are but a few examples. In the 20th century, such psychological knowledge gradually was introduced to legal proceedings in the form of expert testimony first in civil courts and later, as the century wore on, in criminal courts. According to Bartol and Bartol in 2014, in the early part of the century, psychologists also began to consult with juvenile courts and offer treatment services to juvenile and adult correctional facilities. By the start of World War II, psychologists like Lewis Thurman had brought intelligence and aptitude testing to the military and some civilian law enforcement agencies. And by mid-century, it was not unusual to see psychologists consulting formally with law enforcement agencies, particularly by offering services for the screening of candidates for police positions. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, psychologists began to testify in courts in increasing numbers. They also joined other mental health professions in submitting amicus briefs to appeal courts, offering scientific information about topics that reached the courts, such as the effects of discrimination or research on human development. They sometimes consulted with lawyers in trial preparation and jury selection, and they began to offer predictions of dangerousness under limited circumstances. Now, in 1981, Locke observed that the relationship between psychology and the law had come of age. Board certification in forensic psychology provided by the American Board of Forensic Psychology had begun in 1978. Shortly afterwards, the American Psychological Association, other known as the APA, established Division 41, the American Psychology Law Society, 
and that society was instrumental in prompting the APA to adopt forensic psychology guidelines in 1991. Forensic psychology was accepted by the APA as a specialty in 2001 and recertified in 2008. Now, in 2010, Hilbram and Brooks noted that forensic psychology had matured. They observed, and I quote, we are closer to identifying best practices across a range of legal contexts that are addressed by forensic psychology research and practice. Now, as the growth in the field is reflected in the development of professional organizations devoted to research and practice in forensic psychology, significant increases in the number of books focusing on the topic and development of undergraduate and graduate training programs, and the establishment of standards for practitioners working in the discipline. Here are a few selected historical benchmarks pertinent to forensic psychology. In 1893, the first psychological experiment on the psychology of testimony is conducted by J. McKin Kettle in Columbia University. In 1903, Louis William Stern of Germany establishes dealing with the psychology of testimony. In 1906, publication of a little-known work, Psychology Applied to Legal Evidence and Other Constructions of Law, by Frederick Arnold. In 1908, publication of Hugo Munsterberg's On the Witness Stand, arguably one of the first professional books on forensic psychology. In 1908, Social Science Brief submitted to an appellate court, the Oregon Supreme Court in Miller v. Oregon. In 1909, Clinic for Juvenile Offenders, established by psychologist Grace Fernald and psychiatrist William Healy. In 1911, Verandoc becomes one of the earliest psychologists to testify in a criminal trial held in Belgium. 1913, first time that psychological services are offered within the U.S. Correctional Facility. It was a women's reformatory in New York State, and that was done by psychologist Eleanor Rowland. In 1917, psychologist lawyer William Marston develops the first polygraph. Shortly after, his expert testimony on the polygraph is rejected by a federal court in Fry versus the United States in 1923 because the polygraph as then developed lacked general acceptance by the scientific community. In 1917, Lewis Thurman becomes the first American psychologist to use psychological tests in the screening of law enforcement personnel. In 1918, first inmate classification system developed by psychologists established by the New Jersey Department of Corrections. New Jersey also becomes the first state to hire full-time correctional psychologists on a regular basis. In 1921, first time an American psychologist testifies in a courtroom as an expert witness, and that was in the State versus Diver in 1921. In 1922, Carl Marby, a psychology professor at the University of Würzburg, Germany, becomes the first psychologist to testify at a civil trial. In 
In 1922, William Marston becomes the first to receive a faculty appointment in forensic psychology as professor of legal psychology at American University. In 1924, Wisconsin becomes the first state to provide comprehensive psychological examinations of all admissions to its prison system and all applications for parole. In 1929, psychologist Donald Schlesinger is appointed associate professor at Yale Law School, qualifying him as the first psychologist granted faculty status in an American law school. And in 1931, Howard Burt's Legal Psychology is published, the first textbook in the forensic area written by a psychologist. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court cites social science research, including that of the psychologist Kenneth and Mommy Clark. In its landmark ruling in Brown v. Board of Education, In 1961, Hans Talk edits one of the first texts in the psychology of crime, legal and criminal psychology. In 1962, psychologists are recognized as experts on the issue of mental illness by DC Court of Appeals in Jenkins versus the United States. In 1964, psychologist Hans Isaac formulates a comprehensive and testable theory on criminal behavior in the book Crime and Personality. In 1968, Martin Reiser, the first prominent full-time police psychology in the United States, is hired by the Los Angeles Police Department. He became instrumental in establishing police psychology as a profession. In 1968, the first PsyD program is established at the University of Illinois. In 1972, under the guidance and leadership of the American Association for Correctional Psychology, which is the AACP, Stanley Brodsky, Robert Livingston, and Asher Patch, correctional psychology becomes recognized as a professional career. In 1973, the first successful interdisciplinary psychology and law program is developed at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In 1978, the American Board of Forensic Psychology provides board certification in forensic psychology. In 1978, the American Psychological Association approves a clinical internship in corrections at the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. In 1991, the American Academy of Forensic Psychology and American Psychology Law Society publishes specialty guidelines for forensic psychologists. In 2001, the American Psychological Association recognizes forensic psychology as a specialty. In 2006, the Committee on the Revision of the Specialty Guidelines for Forensic Psychologists recommends a broader definition that encompasses research as well as clinical practice. In 2008, the American Psychological Association recertifies forensic psychology as a specialty. In 2013, the specialty guidelines for forensic psychology are published. 
Forensic psychology is described as professional practice by any psychologist working within any subdiscipline of psychology. For example, clinical, developmental, social, and cognitive. When applying the scientific, technical, or specialized knowledge of psychology to the law to assist in addressing legal, contractual, and administrative matters. And in 2013, police and public safety psychology, the PPSP, is recognized by the American Psychological Association as a specialty. Now remember, in these series of lectures, I will be covering the five subcategories or subspecialties of forensic psychology. They include police and public safety psychology, legal psychology, psychology of crime and delinquency, victimology and victim services, and correctional psychology. And in our next lecture, we will be reviewing forensic psychology and the practice which is evident in numerous contexts. We will be reviewing examples of a few things forensic psychologists do. Forensic psychology versus forensic psychiatry and also forensic social work. We will also dive into ethical issues and careers in psychology to include education and training, graduate training at the doctoral level, licensure, employment, the applied specialties, also, we will be talking about forensic psychology as a specialty, educational and training requirements towards your goal of becoming a forensic psychologist. <music>